So Burma, Jakob Burma is well known in the history of philosophy and theology. He's a 17th century mystic philosopher, theologian, had an enormous impact on German philosophy and psychoanalysis. And his bio is somewhat dramatic, and so it's been repeated perhaps too often. But he was a shoemaker, he was uneducated, and he reputedly had mystical experiences, which compelled him to generate voluminous masses of speculative theological writing. I don't think that Burma should be considered a mystic, however. Uh, I think he should be called a theosopher before that term was turned into something else by Madame Blavatsky and the occultists of the 19th century. It meant somebody who understood something of God on the basis of intuition or the gift of Sophia, understood in the Hebraic sense as the wisdom that God grants us rather than the wisdom that we might possess as a natural virtue or acquire. So Sophia grants uh, Burma an understanding of things divine, which he then endeavors tirelessly to explicate to others. So he, he has every intention of being understood. And so it's, it's not mystical in the sense of pointing towards an ineffability. You'll never see, you, or very rarely will Burma say, you know, these things cannot be understood, they can only be experienced. That's not the line he takes. And then when we think about how 19th century German philosophy is preoccupied with making explicit and making exoteric what is still esoteric in Burma, the point becomes even more important. He's a contemporary of Descartes. And I like to think of, of him as the other beginning of modernity because of his, of his central importance to the tradition, but also because of the way he starts the modern project. And I'll say something about that in a moment. But first, I think the elephant in the room is really the theological critique against Burma, a, cri a criticism that he actually suffered from in his own lifetime as he was silenced by the Lutheran authorities for delving into matters that he had no business going into and also for saying things about God, which really were heterodox and violated the tradition. The main argument, which still stands, is that Burma threatens the principle of divine aseity, the idea that God is perfect and infinite and needs nothing. He's complete in himself. Therefore, he doesn't become in time. He doesn't desire things the way we do. He doesn't set goals for himself and struggle to achieve them. Burma threatens this and gives us a God who develops or a God who evolves, a God who seems to need creation in order to be God. And this, uh, what, what has been called the agonism of Burma's theological model, the theogony, uh, is untenable from a, a Christian or even a Jewish or Muslim scholastic perspective, which would insist that God is pure act without potency. So granted that that crit criticism is somewhat justified, what we don't hear enough about is why did Burma do this? Why did he, why did he threaten this sacred principle? Um, of course, he didn't, he didn't have a scholastic education, so he hasn't worked through the metaphysics of act and potency. And in some respects, this is a kind of advantage he has. He's a little bit like an outsider artist. You know, he... He's all the more original for being isolated from the central currents of his time. So he's not at all concerned with preserving the pure actuality of God, because it's not really a principle that he finds in the Luther Bible. And that's his primary source. When you look into the Luther Bible, you, don't know, you do not find God defined as being unless you follow certain scholastic readings of Exodus 3.14. It's just simply not a concern. What you find is a God who is concerned with his people, who develops with his people, is involved in a relationship, suffers for his people, grows angry with his people, sends the Christ to redeem his people, a God who is in every way involved in the history of his people. Burma's question, however, is uh, still a vital theological question, namely, who is God such that God would create the world? The world which Burma believed to be neither wholly good as the Neoplatonists might have it, nor wholly evil as a Gnostic would have it, but a mixture of good and evil, a world that becomes in time, a world that is in large part material. Who could God be such that he would create the world? And here I think Burma in his somewhat striking originality has hit upon a real sore point in the history of scholastic Aristotelian theology. This is what Schelling picks up on that from a certain pers traditional perspective, the pure act, the infinite perfection, God conceived as infinite perfection needing nothing, 
eternally present and real, has no relationship to, to that which he creates. He has no reason to create it, and the being that he creates has no real ontological status in relationship to him, which leads to nature becoming a kind of accident without any sense of its own. So one of the ways in which the tradition has dealt with this is by finding the meaning of nature in the divine exemplars. So what's real in nature is that part of it which you know, corresponds to an idea in the mind of God. But the materiality, the potency, that's all just some kind of illusion. Uh, Burma will have none of this. Burma wants to explain the world of nature as he finds it. And he, he strikes upon a second ex extremely original idea, which is his method. He decides that the way to understand who God would be such that God would create the world is to look at himself on the solid biblical presupposition that the human being is a mago Dei, created in the image of God. And what most images God in the human being is the soul. So he looks into his soul. He conducts, if you like, a self-analysis, not unlike what Freud and Jung did several centuries later, in order to see who he is. And this leads to what I think of as the other beginning of modernity, because at the same time, Descartes is looking into himself, conducting an introspective analysis to ground modern philosophy. But the two end up with, with really astonishingly different results. So for Descartes, the self is primarily consciousness and reason. For Burma, the self is primarily will and desire. Will is older than consciousness for Burma. Freedom is older than consciousness. Freedom is even older than the divine. And this thought, I think, uh, lays the groundwork for the, the dynamic psychology of the 19th and 20th century, the psychology of the unconscious. Burma's system, if you could call it that, is well enough known. There is the unground, the groundless ground, which divides into two contesting drives that generates a third synthesizing principle. And then the whole thing is reflected back through the Sophia principle, the mirror of wisdom. We don't have to get into the arcana of those details, however interesting they are. But what, what Burma is doing with this, you know, this unusual heterodox metaphysics is he's giving articulation to what he thinks he can find in the Luther Bible, which is that the proper name of God is not being, but life. God is the the archetype of life, if you like. God is the being that is most alive. And here one thinks of the recurrence of the term life in the scriptures, all throughout the Old and the New Testament. Just one example, First John, uh, God is life and in him we are all alive and he comes into our community in order to make possible a new life. And so for Burma, and I think he's on solid ground here, for something to be alive is for something to grow, to develop, to have uh, polarity within itself, to have complexity within itself, to have a beginning, for example, to have a beginning and a middle and an end even. Uh, and for this reason, uh, Burma is willing to risk orthodoxy on giving an account of God as a life, as a self-developing principle and archetype of all that lives. With this uh, in place, Burma then gives us a concept of nature, which I think is fundamentally new in the tradition. Nature is no longer this floating accident, the essence of which is really an idea in the mind of God and properly belongs there. Nature now has a kind of being of its own by virtue of being so deeply rooted in the divine unconscious, you could say. Nature is sourced both essentially and existentially to God. It's not just the forms of nature that are originating in God. It's the matter of nature itself. And so Burma gives us, I think, something that's been un underappreciated lately, which is a notion of divine materiality. There's nothing sub-divine about the material order for Burma. And everything that happens in matter, it's not all good, certainly, but everything that happens, all the forces and and dynamism of material processes coming to be, all of that really is directly expressive of the divine mind. So I thought to read a passage from the text of Burma's that I find most comprehensible, 
Wilma has been described as the most difficult read in the history of philosophy and theology. It's, it's not untrue. Uh, the text that I want to look at is a later text. It's from 1623, and it's called On the Election of Grace, or von der Nadenwahl. And it was actually Franz von Bader who pointed this out to be to me as, uh, as the text that's in which Burma is probably most accessible. And I'd also like to flag a translation of it that's getting a bit hard to find, but it was done in 1930 by um, um, a philologist at the University of Oxford. In fact, he had the chair that J.R. Tolkien would take in the generation after him. His name is John Ralston Earle. It's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent translation and it, it preserves the Baroque quality of, of Burma's German while also making the concepts um, uh, contemporary and comprehensible. So the passage I have here is from chapter one on the election of grace and it's paragraph nine. And it's describing who God is prior to creating the world. In fact, I think I'll start a little earlier. I'll start in eight. God is to be considered as to what he is apart from nature and creature in himself in a self-comprehensible chaos, independent of ground, time, and place. In this chaos, the eternal nothing comprehends itself in an eye or eternal power of seeing for the beholding, feeling, and finding of itself. In such case, it cannot be said that God has two wills, one to evil and the other to good. For in the unnatural, uncreaturely deity, there's nothing more than a single will, which is also called the one God. And he wills in himself nothing more than just to seize and find himself, to go out from himself, and with the outgoing, bring himself into an intuition by which is understood the triad of the deity together with the mirror of his wisdom or the eye of his seeing. Therein are understood all powers, colors, wonders, and beings in the eternal one wisdom in equal weight and measure without properties as a single ground of the being of all beings. And the longing that is found in himself or a desire for somewhat, a longing for manifestation. Just one brief word on this. So before God is God, there is a longing of the ungrund or that which is prior to God for God. So God's being, not unlike our own being, is rooted in a desire for being. You could say that God is the first existential subject in the Heideggerian sense. You know, his existence is to be. It stands before him as a task. The other point, which is somewhat buried in the passage there, is the reference to Sophia. He doesn't name her there, but when he speaks of the mirror of his wisdom, he's speaking about the divine feminine. And because this is such an important topic for subsequent thinking, and because sophiology is having a, a bit of a moment, it's worth, it's worth flagging it here. So this unconscious, uh, this unconscious principle of divinity longs for itself and its longing uh, is not responding to something, but generating something. What it generates is an image of a possible God. And that image is reflected back to it in, uh, in the figure of Sophia, which Burma picks up from Proverbs 8. So the eternal, the eternal partner of God who is with God in the beginning and through whom, whom God all creates all that he creates. Sophia holds the wisdom up to God's mind. So she has, in that gendered sense, you know, gender binary sense, she's passive, uh, she's not a fourth person of the Trinity. She reflects the whole God back to God's self. And this image of, uh, of Sophia, which is then, uh, um, which is given to the human being, and it's the principle whereby a theosopher can understand God in, in an intuition, uh, it starts right here. Burma is the first to take the figure from Proverbs 8, and construct of it an internal metaphysical dynamic whereby God has within God's self a passive principle which inaugurates the whole movement of desire becoming will, becoming decision to be God and therefore to create the world.